Well, good afternoon, everyone. With what appears to be just a few days left in the session, I want to talk a little bit about where I think we are. At the beginning of the year, I asked the legislature that we work together on three priorities affecting Vermonters right now, housing, affordability, and public safety. Given what we've all heard from Vermonters, I'm disappointed with the lack of progress in all three. Take housing. While some legislators on both sides of the aisle have been true champions for housing Vermonters can afford, it's clear it was not a top priority for the legislature as a whole. If it were, we'd have spent more time on bills to increase housing stock instead of an incredible amount of time on a bill that actually expands regulation in the vast majority of the state, especially in rural areas of, our, of Vermont. All session, I ask that we keep the housing and conservation bills separate. But even when they've combined them as a political strategy, I was willing to try to find a way to make it work. The Senate has worked with us in some areas. And while far from perfect, they sent the bill back to the House, where we hoped to further improve the bill. But it appears last minute changes could make it even worse. We've offered multiple paths forward, including a number of compromises on my end. And we've continued to meet with House members today to see if we can reverse some of the areas of disagreement. So it remains to be seen if housing is a priority many claim it to be. On affordability, I'll start with some good news. Although I still believe it spends a bit too much, the budget appears to be on a path to something I can live with. This has been a rare example over the last two years where legislators chose to work with me and my team. And again, although it's nowhere near perfect from my perspective, I think it can work. Unfortunately, that's not the case with the yield bill, which sets property tax rates. I've been clear, Vermonters simply cannot afford a historic double-digit property tax increase. Whether it's an average increase of 15% or 12.5%, it's still way too much, and I cannot accept it. And voters are showing their concerns as well. And the lack of action in this building has put school boards in a tough spot. The frustrating part is it didn't have to be this way. We've seen this train wreck coming for years. And we certainly saw it when the December 1st letter came out. And I've offered a path forward that could soften the blow in the short term while giving us time to work together to implement the structural changes and give school boards some tools to contain costs in a way that encourages and ensures better outcomes for our educators, kids, and families. It appears the legislature will instead move forward with historic increases and little long-term cost containment other than kicking the can down the road with more studies, leaving schools with hard choices and cuts right now, and taxpayers with double-digit tax increases. And we know we'll be right back in this situation again next year. We need to take the time right now to address the educational crisis, not two years from now. There are many other bills where we've offered constructive paths forward, but have been ignored, like the Renewable Energy Standard, which will unnecessarily increase Vermonters' electric bills by hundreds of millions of dollars. I wish, instead of spending so much time and so much effort debating how to increase costs on Vermonters, the legislature would focus on how to make it easier to stay in Vermont and more attractive for families to move here and for businesses to stay here and move here as well. That's what I'll continue to focus on and how I'll consider bills that come to my desk in the coming weeks. With that, 
I'll open up to questions. Going back to the six eighty seven that's gonna be on the house floor this afternoon, right before we walked in, Representative Amy Sheldon walked out. I guess did you speak with her? Did you walk away with seeing anything? I, I did not uh, speak with her, but we had members of the staff speaking with her about pass forward. And we'll see what, what will come of that. I just don't know at this point. And I mean it's very late in the game. I mean, are there any tangible examples that you can give of something you would like to see on the house floor this afternoon? There's there's all kinds of things uh, we would like to see inserted in the bill. Uh, a lot of them um, both are trying to, to have more housing available uh, in the short term, um, but also more cost containment in the long term as well. Um, you know, or not cost containment, uh, but permit uh, regulation, regulatory um, improvements in the future. Because I see this as a short term game gain and a uh, but a long term and negative uh, in some respects uh, having <clears throat> so much of our state having to go uh, through a regulatory process act 250 um, and will um, will impair i believe the rural parts of our state so we're trying to make some some adjustments there and have both um, but we're we're still talking and there are some exemptions though in that tier one a one b all that progress at all or just it's not enough well again you have to weigh uh, the good and the bad uh, you know from my perspective if um, you know and they've made it worse by actually becoming more aggressive uh, and and not and not putting off some of these regulatory changes uh, to the future um, so uh, by a year or two uh, more than than what we had hoped for so again, you have to weigh that out. The short-term gains, gains are good, um, and we need more housing, as we've consistently said. But if the, if the negatives outweigh the, the positives, um, we'll, we'll weigh that out and decide what to do. Governor, we've been working on Act 250 for a number of years now. It's been studied several times. I mean, what's the chance that everybody walks away you know, from this legislative session at the end? Uh, it's probably 50-50 at this point, from my perspective. But they have the supermajority. I mean, they've proven that over and over again. I mean, they don't, they don't need me. Uh, they can over, uh, override any veto I put in place. As complex as the Act 250 conversation has been over the past few years, I think some would say the education funding, the long-term education finance reform conversation might be um, complex as well. How do you expect that conversation to go over the next, let's just say, three, five years, seeing what you've seen over the past few years with Act 250? So are you separating Act 250 yeah, from I'm everything else? What lessons, I guess, can you glean from the Act 250 reform conversation we've been having for the past five or so years in applying that to education, finance, and our schools? Well, all of that, you know, all of that is difficult. I mean, in, on both sides, in both of those examples, um, we've talked about um, educational finance reform uh, and cost containment and, and education spending uh, for the last eight to ten years, and uh, we haven't gotten very far. We've been ignored in some respects. Um, so now we're in the situation we're in with a historic tax increase. And that's gotten the Vermonters uh, the attention it probably deserves um, because it affects their pocketbooks, right? They, they may not understand uh, how we get uh, the, un the educational formula, but they certainly understand a tax bill they can't afford. And so um, it's the same, same situation here in some respects, um, but it's more long-term. They won't understand, they'll see the short-term uh, in, in with Act 250, uh, the, the short-term gains associated with that, uh, but it's not going to be long if they have their way, especially with the, with the House measures they're putting forward, um, that in two years' time, um, most areas of the state, the rural areas of the state, will be impacted, and you won't be able to build a whole lot without an Act 250 permit. Just as a follow-up on the education finance funding, you know, you would talk about um, you know, your administration has floated a number of proposals over the years. 
Has the Agency of Education done any modeling or have any estimates of how much money that, that would have saved us uh, or how much you know, dollars and cents that, that would have brought down um, uh, education spend? I'm, I'm sure we have some of that information, um, but, um, but you know, we can't keep going to, to the past. We have to look to the future. Um, but, uh, but we know some of the changes that need to be made. And I think uh, now uh, some in the legislature see that and agree with that. I was encouraged when the House came out, uh, when they floated their yield bill to begin with, um, but uh, quickly pulled that back and, uh, and then put off some of the changes, uh, put a study into place, an 18-month study, uh, that, uh, that to take a look at some of the, the initiatives that we all agree need to be addressed right now. Because it can't wait. I mean, you put a study in place for 18 months, and you're looking at three years before, by the time you get the study back and, and put that into place and the legislation and, and everything that we've been going through over here in this building will happen again. So you're looking at, at best, you know, three years. And, and this isn't going away. You know, that we're gonna see another December 1st letter next year that I think is going to be similar to what we saw this year if we don't make structural changes today. So that's why it's so critical that we have this conversation right now. We accelerate uh, that study, provide some relief to taxpayers, wh however we can, and uh, give us a little time uh, to put uh, to, to have this study a six-month study, not an 18-month study, and then put things into place next year. Is that realistically what you think could happen in the final days of the session? You're not suggesting necessarily that they take up some of your cost containment measures in the next 72 hours. No, no I, don't, I don't believe uh, that's being realistic. So what are you really saying? What I'm that? saying is accelerate the, the study, not an 18-month study, make it like five, six months. We've proven in this building how quickly uh, they can react. I mean, this massive Act 250 conservation bill uh, was put together in, what, two, three months? It seems like we could do something with with known facts about educational uh, financing reform that we've kicked around for last decade could be put into place too. So accelerate the study, uh, come to some agreement uh, by the next legislative session, and then put that into place. In the meantime, this deferment we've been talking about, or some variation of the deferment, providing for tax relief. I mean, I was, I was encouraged uh, working with the with the House and the Senate on the budget bill, the conference committee, uh, being able to put 25 million uh, in there for costs uh, for, for property tax relief, but we need more. Um, and we've had some ideas about that, but we also feel as though we can do something to, uh, to defer those payments. So we're still working on that, and we hope um, we'll see some movement. Are the tax increases a problem? for uh, offsetting some of the property taxes? The like the DFR, DFR fees? Oh, uh, I thought there was a short-term rental tax. And it, the it was a streaming tax. tax. The streaming tax yeah. we took, we were successful in taking out. Okay. Uh, that was one of our asks, and they did that. Um, and the, uh, the EFR fees are still in there. Uh, but those are more difficult to um, to argue against when, when you have real life, like the streaming tax would affect somewhat of a regressive tax, uh, would affect uh, Vermonters instantaneously. And we've had enough of that, I believe. There is a software uh, tax in there, software use tax in the, in the yield bill as proposed yesterday. Yes. That's, that's there. Yes, I believe so. It's hard to follow um, all the moving pieces in the yield bill or any bill at this point. Um, Governor, are you aware of the uh, Tap Trees Not Vermonters rally scheduled for here tomorrow? Have you been asked to attend? And w what do you think of this coalescing tax protest? I wasn't aware of it. So suffice it to say that I have, have, I'm not aware that I was invited. I just want to be clear on the yield bill. If that 18 month study was changed to six months, you would support the bill? Oh, no. No, no. I didn't say that. Okay. That's one of the suggestions along right. the way. 
um, actually that would that would help um, at least having having that instead of a, you know extending it to an 18 month study having a six month study that would that would be helpful but we need the structural changes talked about we also need deferment we need property tax relief right now so that would all have to be worked in as well seems like one of the disagreements between you know with the deferment plan is about what effect potentially if at all it could have on our credit rating you said that the credit agencies take into account the affordability and the, the trajectory and sustainability of our state the treasurer has said loaning out money to ourselves essentially could also hurt have you had any direct conversations with the treasurer of like how, how yeah. you square those i things? have not uh, spoken with him directly but our, our team has and you know, I still believe uh, that there's a path forward there. Um, it just depends on on the question and how we put it into place. Uh, and there's an interesting proposal I heard in the last uh, 24 hours that could work, and I'm not prepared to talk about it. But but there's something there that that might might be helpful. Um, but I, as I said before, I'm you know I've been part of these rating agency uh, briefings and. Uh, and meetings uh, for the last seven years and, and further. Um, in fact, I did some, I was participating in some when I was in the Senate as well as a chair of a money committee. So it's been consistent, their concerns, uh, their concern about our demographics, the affordability of Vermont, um, a, a somewhat of a collapse of our educational finance system uh, certainly would get their attention. Um, this will get their attention as well. So, you know, we may see a, a, a downgrade um, if we do nothing. And as I've said before, I want to give Vermonters relief. Uh, I want to help the, the school boards and the communities out as well. If we, had, if we went with some sort of deferment, uh, we might not have all of the um, all the debates we're having right now and all the votes on some of the, the school issues um, because we could defer some of that, that payment. But if you did a deferment and you use some surplus money to buy down the statewide property tax rate, aren't you also guilty of taking the can down the road? But that, I'm saying put in the structural reforms if we could. Um, but, but certainly the, the accelerating that time frame to have those discussion it's, it all has to be tied uh, to structural reform or it's all for naught. And I, I would agree. If we don't have any serious conversations about structural reform, um, there's, there's no sense in buying down those rates with, with surplus money. That doesn't help the situation because we'll be back here as well. Mm -hmm. Have you considered calling the legislature back for a special session this summer for a, a short period of time? I think we might have a, a session coming up in June uh, that would suffice. To solve the Ed funding issue, Maybe. though? You think, should they extend the veto session just to stay here until it's done? We'll you see. Think? You know, there's still time to come to agreement here. So I think, um, and knowing that there's a pretty good chance to be coming back in June. That'll give us time in between uh, to have more productive conversations. Lawmakers are actually pretty proud of themselves for getting the 20% tax increase down to 12.5 because of the cloud tax and the $25 million you mentioned and the short-term rental fee, which I think they increased, they doubled it recently in order to get it down to 12.5. Why are you? not satisfied with that, I guess. 12, no, 12.5%, 12, 12. that's why I'm not satisfied. I mean, in the past, I mean, we, we, I had concerns over an increase of 4 or 5% in years past. 12.5%, this was on top of the 8% they had last year. I mean, when are Vermonters going to say enough is enough and say, I can't afford to live here. I love my state. I want to stay here. I want my family to grow up here, but I simply can't afford it. When, when's that day of reckoning? I think it's sooner rather than later if we continue along this path. Fewer kids in the education system, 
not getting enough money to the kids. You know, we need, we need structural reform, and it doesn't mean just cutting. It means just more efficiency, more structural reform, making sure that, you know, classroom sizes are bigger. It could mean um, having, uh, you know, co-locating schools and so forth. I mean, this is all kinds of things. We want to help the municipalities get through this. And we can do it together, but we have to have a path. We have to have a plan to do that. Most people, when they hear that, think school closures. That you're I, making that yeah, that's not, smaller, that's, no. I'm not saying that it's, it's not, there will be some, there would have to be some, uh, but, but that's not what we're talking about. There's other ways to find efficiencies, and there's other ways to have structural reform without closing schools. But we have to have that conversation. Uh, back to the active bill for a second. Um, why is it that the interim exemptions for virtually all of the communities in the state for projects in near the downtowns, uh, and then a long-term plan to allow some of those or many of those communities to also get exemptions from Act 50 doesn't doesn't accomplish the red tape cutting that you had hoped for and the regulatory reform you hoped for to spur housing. Right. Well, again, from what I've heard. And this is a moving target in some respects. Uh, but what I heard was um, at one point, uh, some of those uh, longer term initiatives would come into play in like 28, 29, something like that, uh, 2028, 2029, maybe 27. Um, but they've been fast forwarded to 2025, 2026. So we're not going to have short-term gain for very long. And, and that concerns me, you know, that they're, they're accelerating the second piece of this, the long-term approach. Um, and that's what I heard in the House, what they're considering. So does that accelerate the time when communities can get permanent exemptions from active Yeah, but, they, but we're going to lose those short-term gains in the meantime. We need, we need housing relief now. I mean, I thought we all, we all campaigned on this, you know, not too long ago. I mean, this, we're not going to have it long enough to have an impact. We need housing today and tomorrow and the next year and the year after that. And putting in place, I, again, we'll weigh this all out, um, but um, this long-term approach uh, that they're considering, I think, will stifle housing. Governor, um, at the top you mentioned that you were disappointed in the legislature's work on all three priority areas. In terms of the third one, public safety, what are you concerned about there? It's, what is well, the there, there's some balance? good things happening there, um, but, um, but it's still in flux. So I'm really not sure what's going to, to actually pass in the long, long run. But, but there is some good news there. So we've done well on some things. Other things aren't being taken up. Uh, I think there are some studies that are even put into place. Um, so all in all, I mean, it's not a, not a deal breaker. What, is, what do you consider the good news specifically? Um, they've, the Senate in particular uh, has worked with us on many, many issues that we put forward. Uh, and, um, and for the most part, again, I believe those will Will survive, um, but um, but there's still a lot lot out there that we'd like to see. So I'm not really sure exactly what's going to pass. There's one bill I think I'll end up with soon. I think that one passed um, that um, that has most of what we'd asked for. So so again, let's wait and see what what we finish up with. Safe injection site bill. I, you know, I've been pretty clear about that one. Um, that's not, um, you know, I'm philosophically and pragmatically opposed to that. I just think it moves us in the wrong direction. It's, it's going to cost uh, some money, not, and I know that's not out of the state coffers. Um, this is part of the settlement money, but it's, uh, you know, a million bucks a year. And I don't think the safe injection sites will be put into, or the one site will be put into place for at least a couple of years. So we're gonna be without that two, three million dollars uh, that we could put into prevention. 
uh, to treatment, um, trying to, to, to put people on a better path now. And so I, I just think that we should go with a strategy that we know works um, that, will, that will help in the short run as well. So I, I just, that one is something that I'm opposed to. Uh, we'll see if they have the votes. I'm sure I'll, I'll end up vetoing that and um, then we'll have to see if there's an override. The health department is publishing new data, or year-end data, I should say, showing fatal overdoses statewide appear to be trending down for the first time since 2019. What do you make of that news? Um, you know, it's, it's good news, um, but we're still seeing deaths, right? So that's, that's the bad news. Um, we started to see that trend pre-pandemic start to, the curve starting to go downward. Um, and then we've seen it since the pandemic accelerate, but now we're seeing that come back down. So I hope that means some of the strategies we've put into place are working and uh, we hope uh, that we can continue to do that and see that trend uh, come down because um, that's what we all want in the end. Does it make you think about the safe injection sites or even money for treatment or recovery or any other initiative differently, seeing the data appearing to go in one direction? Well, it isn't. I felt this way before the data uh, confirmed what I was thinking, that we have approaches we think are working um, with treatment, uh, prevention. I'd like to see us do more in terms of prevention than we're doing now, harm reduction as well. Um, so I'd rather put the money that they want to use for the safe injection sites into those areas that we know benefit us and benefit them. Last question. The uh, law enforcement and service providers that we speak with are seeing a pretty big uptick in methamphetamines, uh, which is a much different drug than opioids, much different response. How, how is the state contending that, that difference, that, that different drug? Yeah, it's, uh, it's always, you know, it's like play, playing whack-a-mole um, with the, the number of drugs that are coming out and becoming more popular. It was uh, um, fentanyl, obviously, is still a, a huge concern for us. Xylenzine all of a sudden rose to the top. Uh, the traditional drugs to continue to still be a problem. So it's like all the above. and and. We uh, continue to do, uh, try and stay uh, up, up, trying to stay um, as up to date as possible uh, to do all we can uh, to help people get through this. But it's difficult for, for the folks on the ground. Supporters of this bill seem to think it's going to help save lives. Do you just fundamentally disagree with that assessment? Well, it, it may save lives, but how many are we going to lose because we didn't get them into treatment or uh, get them, keep them from using in the, in the first place with prevention? So again, that's our philosophical difference. Um, but, um, but I think, again, I think we're, we're all on the same page. We want to save lives. We just have a different outlook on how to do that. Got a few folks on the phone. We'll start with Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, <clears throat> the Biden administration recently uh, launched a new broadband equity access plan that's going to release $900 million. Uh, they blocked Starlink last time as one of the potential providers, but this time each state is going to be able to pick their vendors. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I might uh, see if, I know we talked about that uh, previously, so I might ask uh, Commissioner Tierney to weigh in on that one. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, what's been interesting in, in watching this area evolve is how um, things that were taken to be hard truth or you know, showstoppers and the like have been uh, revised as the federal government has dispersed this money. And so it doesn't surprise me that we now see second thoughts about um, things like Starlink, because at the end of the day, the objective is to get everybody affordable broadband. Um, it may not yet be defined as a necessary public utility service in federal law, but there's wide agreement that it ought to be. 
And even if it isn't, it certainly should be treated that way. And so when you look at Starlink, um, as inferior as it may be in some people's opinion, as a means of accessing broadband, when you have none at all, it looks very different. And so I think it is generally a good idea for there to be as much flexibility as, poss as possible. But um, the particulars about what is preferable as between two or three options is something really that uh, should possibly be better addressed to the folks who are doing this work in Vermont. And that would be Director Hallquist at the Vermont Community Broadband Board. Appreciate that. One question I have, it's interesting uh, to hear um, oftentimes in the, in the research we've done about this, <clears throat> we found that the opinions about uh, Starlink being inferior are based on their dislike of Elon Musk and not the actual facts. Uh, we have many, many uh, readers who use Starlink and I would say 99.5% of them are incredibly happy with the service and the price and get um, very fast internet service faster than some of the broadband companies are promising with almost no outages and self-corrections. So I'm curious, will that process move from opinions to more data when they make that decision? Well, um, Tom, not to argue with you, but I'm not sure I could agree that, um, that other opinions have necessarily to date not been based on data. That's why it's important to you know, consider who is giving you that opinion and where Vermont is concerned, apart from what you just described, which is the experience of many people you're familiar with. Um, it's also good to speak with the folks who, as I said, are doing the direct work on assessing this. I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Director Hallquist has some personal experience with Starlink as well, and so it might be good to hear from her as too. But with that said, what you're pointing to is the advisability of making any such decision on the basis of fact and not on the basis of you know, who you like or who you don't like or what you think you know about a technology or not. Um, so you're, you're really zeroing in on a very important point in this discourse because at the end of the day, very important that everybody gets something and sooner rather than later. I appreciate that. Uh, the one thing I did notice in some of the postings I see on social media, particularly from fairly well-known weather meteorologists in Vermont, is the <clears throat> claims that, that Starlink doesn't work well for Vermont because it's too cloudy. Um, clouds have no impact whatsoever on satellite service. Um, so it would be interesting. I think it's more about the ability for people who don't want to wait the very, very, very long time it will take us to to do this wonderful broadband expansion for the entire state. So yeah, yeah. Well, I think also on this. Yeah, I was going to say, in, in in working in this area for as long as I have, one thing I have also learned is uh, several apparently contradictory things can be true all at once. The meteorologist's experience can well be connected to cloudiness without clouds necessarily interfering with satellites or being able to, and it can also be true that something that works very well for some people in some parts of the state simply doesn't work well for others. This is an argument that I have with the federal government all the time because, you know, from their perspective, often policies are guided by what worked in Mississippi or Kansas, where its rain is very flat, for instance. So for what it's worth, um, I think uh, the thing to do is to chase down as many sources as you can here, and secondly, to keep in mind that one size doesn't always fit all, but we're looking for as many sizes as possible. Much appreciated, Secretary. Uh, no other questions. Thank you. Back to you, Governor. Keith Rutten Harold. Uh, hi. Regarding education tax costs, um, you might. I think if I've heard it said, a double-digit increase is not what we want. Is is anyone said? what level of increase would be acceptable? I don't know if there's been a hard number thrown out there or what. Um, I go back to, I, you know, I'd like to see it down to around the 4% range. Okay, thank you. Tim McQuiston, Rod Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Following up on Jalva's and Bob's questions earlier about finding different um, funding sources. It, it, you know, a lot of these taxes that are being proposed will never come down, as you, as you well know, once they're established. 
But the income tax is something that has been flexible, very flexible over the years. And I know that you would be opposed to any real tax increase, but it, could that be a, um, a horse trading um, option in the short term to you know get get those property taxes paid down, or is there just too many obstacles? Yeah, this I, I I agree with you wholeheartedly in terms of once you impose a tax, it, it never goes away. I remember um, when I was in the Senate, um, in fact, I probably voted for it. We increased the sales tax uh, with, the, um, with the thought that there was a sunset on that. Um, we're going to reduce that from six, you know, we increase it to six, it's going to go down to five. Um, that never happened. And uh, I, I just don't believe any tax increase we put into place will ever be eliminated. Um, but again, I want to, to stress that when we talk about educational reform, um, and, and we could have a conversation about different sources of funding, uh, not just rely on property taxes, um, but, um, but they, from my standpoint, get to the structural reform first, uh, to take that approach, uh, become as efficient as possible, uh, but then incorporate you know, a number of taxes, different taxes if we want, uh, without increasing the costs. So we can rejigger in some respects uh, the where the money comes from uh, without necessarily increasing our tax burden. Uh, thanks, Governor. Another, another question, just uh, quickly. Uh, uh, Bernie's running for re-election. Any, any thoughts on, on that? I, I can't say that I'm surprised. Um, he, he did contact me the other day to let me know, and, and I, I said that to him, um, that I wasn't surprised to hear. Um, you know, I will say this. <clears throat> Longevity in the Senate is a gain for Vermont. Uh, we saw that with uh, Senator Leahy. Um, that's the way the power structure works <clears throat> in uh, D.C. and in the Senate in particular. particular. <clears throat> so. I hope he continues um, at, because I think that uh, it'll be a, a gain for Vermont. You get more power, we get more resources. All right, great. Thank you, Governor. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Good afternoon. No questions. Thank you. Back to the room. Governor, um, protesters in Middlebury took down their encampment earlier this week. Uh, today, we're learning that the major vast majority of uh, students at UVM are also going to be clearing out. Your initial, I mean, have you heard about this, or your initial response? I hadn't heard uh, that they were, they were taking down their encampment, uh, but, um, but I think that's positive news. Uh, it's the end of, um, it's end of their session, and they will be uh, we have commencement, I think, uh, coming up in the next week or so. And so I, I think it would be better for the commencement, for the families coming to see uh, their kids uh, graduate. I think it would be better without all the controversy. So I think it's good news. And, and again, I'm thankful it was peaceful. And that was what I'd said. I believe in, in the First Amendment, uh, free speech, and the right to assemble. And uh, as long as they're adhering to the rules, and uh, it appears that they did so uh, peacefully, and that's that's important. UN Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield was no longer. That was one of the concessions. We, we don't know whether it was whether she pulled out or whether it was the school's decision, but she will no longer be the, the commencement mm -hmm. speaker. I mean, how how does that factor into this? Do you think? I, I have no idea um, whether it factored into UVM's decision, her decision, or the encampment, uh, what they're doing. I just, I just don't know. But, um, but again, less maybe from her perspective, um, she didn't want to cause a controversy. Uh, maybe she reflected on the families and the parents and, and, the, and those kids that are graduating uh, to have, have their day. When you were discussing Bernie and the longevity in the Senate, you said, I hope he continues. Yeah, well. Yeah, it sounds like an endorsement. No, it's not an endorsement, but, um, but at the same time, uh, again, I know how the Senate works. Uh, and uh, without, that, without that senior person 
in the Senate, in that position, um, we're at the bottom of the list, so to speak. We, we've learned that um, in real time with uh, Senator Leahy retiring. Uh, he brought a lot to Vermont and, uh, and, and we're, con we're continuing to see uh, that um, what, he, what he brought to the state, but as well, uh, that's over at this point in time. So again, it's, um, you know, it's not an endorsement, but, uh, but it doesn't surprise me and I think it will be beneficial for Vermont. He's popular here in the state and um, it'll be good for, for uh, bringing resources into the state as well. What do you make of the Progressive Party uh, not too happy saying you went against years of precedent replacing their House caucus leader, Adam Mulvaney, Stanek, now mayor with Abby Duke earlier? Like, what do you just make of their argument? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to make of it, really. Um, you know, from my standpoint, um, I was just trying to make a decision. She, Emma, had, had run and had sought the Democratic nomination had received it, so she was actually uh, a DP. And I felt an obligation to reach out to both parties, to have them forward names, and I picked uh, the, the person that I think was ready for the position, and, um, but I had good conversations with both sides, and, but I'm, I, I, I thought it was, I was laughable in some respects when I was accused of playing uh, politics with this. And I just don't see that to be the case. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get someone that's going to probably oppose everything that I do, uh, regardless of the choice I made. Um, so override every veto uh, or try to, and uh, probably not um, sympathize with everything that I put forward. So I, I, if I wanted to play politics, I probably would have found a Republican that had never said they were a Republican and put them into place. That's playing politics, choosing someone who has is, who is been a progressive Democrat um, in Burlington. I don't think it's playing politics. It's but trying to be, it's trying to be fair. She was the head of the Progressive Caucus. But she, the sought, then why, she, right? sought, she sought the nomination. I understand. But you knew going into it by pointing, I mean, I, I've been to, on maybe five or 10 occasions, you've stood here and said, you're not required by law to, when you do a, uh, an appointment to follow the party of the, of the person, but you feel it's important to do that. She's clearly a progressive. You knew going into it by appointing a Democrat, you were gonna ruffle some feathers here. No, oh, I did, you I did didn't, it anyway. I, no, I, didn't, I no. didn't know that at all, no. I, and I don't agree with that. She sought the nomination to be on the Democratic ticket. She was a Democrat, progressive, right? From my standpoint, I, I don't know that you can, I totally disagree with your assessment because I, I don't see how you can look at it any differently. You actively pursued the nomination of the Democrats and succeeded. It may not matter, sure I think she goes by PD. He's a okay. progressive and then a Democrat. So she counts herself as a progressive. She caucuses with the progressives, did come up with Nathan Stanley, did. So. But ran with Democrats. That's true. Primary, that's that's true. Progressive primary. That is true. So. It's just, again, I, I, I don't understand, to be perfectly honest. We sent them, we sent notices to both parties. They both knew it. Didn't hear a peep out of anybody until after I made the choice. I, I, if they had, if they were that concerned, I'm surprised they didn't raise the red flag then. On another subject, uh, back to the OPC subject again, please, Governor. Um, you said that you would prefer to see the money dedicated to OPCs, which is a million bucks, spent on treatment and prevention, but and harm reduction. Well, and harm reduction. And yes. harm reduction. <clears throat> But that million dollars is coming from a tax on pharmaceuticals. Would you support a tax on pharmaceuticals to increase treatment prevention and harm reduction supplies? Is it all coming from, and, and this is, I thought this was part of the settlement money. 
They were I was that. under the impression that the million dollars for the overdose prevention sites was coming exclusively from a new tax on pharmaceuticals. I knew that there, at one time that was, but I believe, I may be wrong, maybe I should call a friend here pretty soon, uh, but I believe that money comes from the settlement. I'm happy to be corrected on that. Oh. Me as well. Yeah, Dr. Levine here. Yes. I believe, I believe you are correct that the original framing of the bill included um, the tax on the pharmaceutical industry, but the current framing uh, is with opioid settlement. Right? Well, at least by one, one source. <laughs> Real quick. As you said, it's a moving target and there are things coming in and out of it, but of the amendments being discussed right now in the House, are there any in particular that you can point to that you would say are poison pills that if they're in the final version, it's a no-go for you? Well, with the accelerated time frame for like the tier concept, that would be, that would be problematic for me, but there's other others as well. We'll see, we'll see. Again, I just want to leave the lines of communication open. Um, we want to, I'd like to get to yes if we can, um, because the short-term gains could be beneficial to the state, and then we can, we'll need to prove ourselves and, and hopefully extend uh, some of the provisions in the future years. But we'll just have to wait and see, but we need, we need some help right now. Yes. Uh, I think they're currently discussing changing some of those amendments as we speak, so we're not even sure what's coming to the floor um, this afternoon. But um, most of what's in the, all of the amendments are fairly problematic um, and take several steps back from the past past seven version. So that would be a better way to phrase the question is, is there anything in it that we want to seek to keep? And I would say there's very little right now based on the last drafts. And, and I, you know, I, I get this. Um, they put a lot of time into this conservation bill in the House. They didn't have, their, their housing bill was, isn't connected with this. They had no housing in this. This was just their Act 250 conservation bill that they pass over to the, to the Senate. The Senate added the housing pieces, um, which wasn't a surprise. I think I predicted that. but. But I think for political purposes, mesh the two together. So I can understand the House uh, being protective of what they, they pass over to the Senate without you know, more consideration for the housing pieces. The yield bill, as it stands, or I know that the, I think there's a floor moment coming this afternoon from Senator Brock. But would you veto it as it stands right now? Um, yeah, without changes, yes. Uh, Governor, back to school budgets. Um, I know a few more revotes passed um, earlier this week. Um, does that encourage you, or do you see this as a recurring problem that's just going to keep needing to be, you know, have mandates signed on? Oh, this, I, I you know, passing uh, the budgets and, and I feel for those communities uh, that have to go through this. Um, and, but without structural reform, we're, we're gonna be continuing this in the near future. That's why I'm being so adamant about doing something now and getting those structural reforms in place and not doing an 18 month study, doing something immediately and, uh, and try and make sure that we protect uh, Vermonters and taxpayers and, and students and teachers and so forth along the way. Finding this path for a deferment, I think, uh, is an ideal, uh, admittedly, but, um, but we're in this position and this is the best path forward, I think, uh, to protecting all interests. Governor, that was a pretty interesting back and forth about Starlink and the opinions of Elon Musk. Just curious to know, what's your opinion of Elon Musk? Well, he's uh, obviously a very controversial figure, uh, and um, but he's brought a lot uh, to the economy, whether it's uh, SpaceX or Tesla or Starlink. 
I mean, these are all beneficial uh, to to the world in some respects. So, I uh, I admire him uh, in some respects. I think um, some of the other the other pieces of uh, his complicated puzzle uh, can be problematic, and we could do without. But um, sometimes you have to take the good with the bad. But specifically, the GA hotel housing program, how that was settled, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I mean, again, it's 20 million more than we had presented uh, originally. It's $44 million right now for the GA program. As a reminder, uh, pre pandemic, I think we were around 7 million. Um, but uh, things have uh, changed since then. Um, so I'm happy uh, that uh, we came to some agreement on what the parameters are in, in the program itself. Um, so I think we can uh, we can make it work. The Senate is not going to be taking up because of the the burden from the property tax uh, issue. They're not taking up the expansion of Medicaid, the expansion of the judiciary, or the uh, housing bill to create units over over 10 years. I mean, how I know you in the House are kind of philosophically maybe a part of on some, how to pay for some of these issues, but you know, what, what what's your reaction to, to those issues or those priorities not necessarily making it across the finish line? Well, again, there's uh, a number of issues every year uh, that don't get across the finish line uh, that disappoint many. Um, there are a number of initiatives that the House had presented uh, pass uh, in terms of new taxes and new programs and so forth um, that, uh, that I don't mind seeing uh, die on the vine, so to speak. Um, so again, we'll, uh, we'll continue to focus on those, the big three uh, for me, the affordability of Vermont, um, public safety, uh, obviously, um, is important as well, and we'll continue to uh, to watch uh, that as well. But um, this educational financing is going to be be important. How do you feel about how this legislative session went overall? <laughs> Assuming it, unless we're back here next week, but how are you feeling? Um, it's been uh, it's been a difficult session for everyone, I think, and. Uh, you know, it started off with a December 1st letter, uh, and uh, I don't think that was taken seriously enough. And then I think there are many who, um, being the second, uh, second half of uh, uh, the legislative session, uh, see that they need to get things done, uh, that they, they see a path forward, and especially when you have a supermajority. It gives you that, uh, that extra horsepower to get some of the things uh, across the finish line. So that's made it, I think, even more difficult. So I think it will, we'll see where it all ends up. Um, I'm thankful uh, the Senate took a more pragmatic approach uh, in terms of the budget. That's going to be helpful, I think, and uh, at least we get that passed, and uh, hopefully, and we we'll, uh, won't have to worry about any shutdowns uh, at the end of the year. Senator Baruth described it as a, a dark legislative session, storm clouds, property tax thing hanging over. I mean, would, would you agree that it's in a, a dark session? Like, how would you characterize it? Yeah, I... You've been I, through many sessions. It's just yeah, I, but I've never seen one like this um, or experienced anything like this. This is just, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on and a lot, you know, moving that I never thought would move. Um, I. I to be honest with you, I thought uh, at the beginning of the session when when we saw that there was going to be a $225 million property tax increase uh, to the tune of about 18%, it went up to almost 20% at one point. I thought the legislature would see the wisdom of maybe let's just get through this, let's help that, fix that for Vermonters, and, uh, and not push forward with all the other tax and spending um, uh, initiatives. And uh, that didn't prove to be the case. It seemed like uh, they had doubled down at that point. So 
it's a, been an interesting one. You said it feels different than sessions past. Why do you think that it's Um, I mean, it's always hectic, uh, especially towards in the second half uh, of, uh, of the legislative term. Um, but this has been, again, been a little bit different. I think having a supermajority, uh, knowing that they can override vetoes, has just uh, has just made it more problematic, uh, and the expectations coming into you know, a November election, I think, weighs into it as well. Well, you've only got a couple of days left. Any uh, words of advice or just thoughts about uh, media coverage? Um, I will ask one thing. I didn't, I'm not going to critique the media. I'm smarter than that. Um, but I would ask uh, that when you're reporting on these bills passing, uh, that you not say that they're on the governor's desk at this point. Uh, the process it takes a while. I mean, we don't get them for sometimes weeks after they're passed by the legislature. They go through their own process, the ledge council and so forth, and then they have to be signed. So at times uh, it could be weeks uh, before we get them. And I hear some of the reports that's sitting on my desk and people are expecting, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to sign it? Are you not going to sign it? Uh, why haven't you signed it? Um, so I would just uh, just ask that you at least at least uh, report that you know it's not on my desk yet. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>